texts in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, uh, where God justly brings judgment uh, and deceives people. You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. Father, we, we invoke you in the name of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we first begin by praising you, loving you, glorifying you, adoring you, for you are God. You alone are God. You are our God, our love, our life. We love you, Father. We need you, Father. We depend on you, Father. We trust in you. We love, we need, we depend and trust in your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus. We love, we need. We depend and trust in your Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, please bless this session. Bless everyone present. Bless me in the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, strengthen my throat, my lungs, my chest. Give me the physical health I need to glorify you, to serve you, to praise you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Fill us with your spirit. Clothe us with your spirit and instruct us by your spirit. Guide me, Father, to interpret Scripture correctly. Save me from stammering, confusion, and error. Fill me with love and passion and boldness. And help me not to be unnecessarily offensive. And Father, help me to be a blessing to your people, all who are present and all who will hear in the future. Anoint them, bless them, fill them with your Spirit. Cover us and cover our loved ones in the precious holy blood of Jesus. Cover my daughters and their mother in the precious holy blood of Jesus. The blood of Christ covering them, protecting them, sealing them preserving them and us father the holy blood of jesus the blood of christ that damn saint to the pit of hell shield us by the blood of christ and cover us by the blood of christ and protect us and our loved ones father and provide for us father we need you i need you please strengthen my voice <clears throat> fill us with the holy spirit fill us with wisdom and knowledge understand your word and to do justice to your word father bless the quality of the sound of the video so it won't be a distraction but will draw people in to hear your word proclaimed as your spirit enables me to do it accurately for the glory of Christ, because it's all about Jesus. May he increase in us, increase in my children, their mother, and our loved ones. May we decrease more of Christ, less of us. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy. And use me to glorify the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Brother, God bless you. We're going to repute James White and one of his <clears throat> assertions in trying to liken what the Quran says about Allah being the deceiver with passages in the Old Testament that talks about Yahweh allowing evildoers to be deceived <clears throat> as judgment for their stiff-necked, rebellious hearts and unbelief. We'll see if the two are the same. And this will again confirm, and I know some people are going to get upset. They're going to think I'm going on a James White bashing. No, I pray in Jesus' name. He purifies all of us, purifies my heart, fills us with love and faith and holiness and trust in Jesus to be more like Christ and also to be patient with one another yet hold each other accountable to the standard of scripture James White included because he's not above reproach he's not above scripture and he's not God's gift to the church or apologetics may God convict him to repent and I'm going to be honest and forthright this man has no business talking about Islam he does more damage than good and I'm going to demonstrate it right now for all to see by the grace of the Lord Jesus and it's not just me who has problems with him. He has problems across the board with many people, even from his own camp, Reformed Baptists and Calvinists. The man really needs to repent, and may God grant him repentance because he is doing a lot of damage, and it's becoming disgusting to listen and see. Forgive me for being honest, but I'm not known for tickling people's ears, right? <clears throat> so, oh. Let's let's hear what he has to say in the most recent dividing line concerning his stance in regards to Christian apologists arguing that the Quran identifies Allah as the best of all deceivers and how one Muslim just got giddy and praised James White for his consistency and honesty. All right, let's see how consistent and honest James White's approach happens to be. Let's see. So now, are we ready? We're going to listen to the clip, and then by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll try to provide a thorough refutation, putting holes in this gross false analogy 
showing again, James White, you have no business talking about Islam. Go back to Mormonism, but leave Islam to those who know, and you're not one of them. Sorry to be honest. And I have to also discourage people from getting his book. That's not one book I'll recommend anytime soon. All right? So, Lord, forgive me. I pray that God will constrain me to speak boldly without tickling anyone's ears, but to do it in love, because it's very hard not to get angry at this man, his arrogance and his disgusting approach. It's really too much to handle. All right? So let's call a spade a spade. Okay. Now let's let's go to the clip, and then we'll address it by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some things. Need to yeah, gotta admit, you know, you can just Sorry. all put it, everything's black and white, and they 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 and we's we, and that's what a lie, man. Yeah, and. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that debate. It's uh, sad that that has not been able to be my primary focus of late, but uh, that's uh, life in the modern evangelicalism. Um, the topic uh, is the cross necessary for salvation. Again, uh, a tremendous opportunity to really engage the subject. You know, it, it, this morning, um, Bassam Zawadi posted a nice thing on Facebook um, where he uh, took a picture of a page from my book on the Quran and uh, was was basically saying you know it's it's nice to see someone honestly engaging it was it, it was the the issue of and, and I, it's always bothered me um, always bothered me but That's again we've been consistent authority. about this for a long long time but there are some people that'll that'll quote uh, Allah is the is the best of deceivers from the Quran and, and make this a big huge uh, argument yeah let's just listen to James White Let's downplay the fact that the Quran describes Allah as the best of all deceivers. Let's not make it a huge argument. After all, <clears throat> James White is about to convince us that the Bible uses similar expressions to describe the true God, Yahweh. Right? So, guys, you heard it from God's gift to Islamic apologetics. Why are we making it a big deal that Allah is called the best of all deceivers? What's wrong with you? Don't you know the Bible says something similar about Yahweh? Because Yahweh deceives people. So so does, or so James White claims. Let's see. And as always, I try to put myself in the other person's shoes, look back toward myself oh, and see. As always, not sometimes. Yeah. Not, and always. Some, not sometimes, always. We have to deal with the reality that there are times that God placed a lying spirit uh, as an act of judgment in the mouths of false prophets. Now, remember, I'm an idiot. I don't have a doctorate like James White does. Can you help me see how does Yahweh allowing evil, unclean spirits to deceive false prophets, to deceive stiff-necked, unrepentant, rebellious sinners, how that is analogous to Allah being called the best of all deceivers? Again, help me understand. Maybe I missed it. Can you can you help me? Honestly, I'm asking honestly. How do you jump from Yahweh permitting lying, evil, unclean spirits to deceive stiff-necked, unrepentant, rebellious blasphemers who have shown a propensity to spurn the truth of God because they love their sin more than they love God and His truth? To the Quran saying Allah is the best of all deceivers. Can, honestly, can, can you help me see the connection? Now I'm going to put holes through his arguments in a minute. But so far, so far, how is how are how is it the same as what the Quran says about Allah? Anyway, I pray by the grace of God, the Lord constrains me so I don't get too animated. But here, let's continue. To bring about the destruction of kings of Israel. Um, and then you have that signal passage, and, and this this may be where it, it would be good if yeah, if yeah. apologists were also regular preachers. Do you see the cheap shot? Do you see the arrogant snipe, the arrogant rant at hominem against apologists? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Because that assumes that if an apologist mentions that Allah is the best deceivers of them all, then that apologist must be ignorant of what Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 12 actually states. And I'm about to embarrass him and put hole in that false analogy. But 
honestly, help me. I'm trying to be as Christ-like as possible. May the Lord forgive me for getting angry. In all honesty, do you sense any humbleness in this man? Do you sense any love in this man? Uh, be, again, be upfront and be honest. You know, I don't want you to tickle my ears. I'm not above reproach either. I'm not above scripture. Do you sense any humbleness and humility that would endear people to even listen to James White and even, even consider whether his criticisms are valid in light of his nasty, arrogant, condescending tone towards apologists? Because you understand what he just said, right? Obviously, an apologist who uses the argument that Allah is the best of all deceivers hasn't preached through the Bible, God's word, and especially 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. After all, if he did, then he'd be like James White. Okay? Anyway, let's see. Let's continue. Who had to work through texts. Um, you have that, that, that text when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Um, about how if you refuse to love the truth, God will cause you to love a lie. And so I just know that there are judgment texts. Okay, help me understand how God causing you to love a lie is the same as saying Allah is the best of all liars and deceivers out there. Again, maybe I'm missing it. Because remember, I'm not a doctor like James White. I don't work through texts like James White does, right? I don't have the knowledge that James White does of the biblical languages. <clears throat> How does God causing people to believe a lie? And I'll explain what it means that God causes people to, to believe in a lie. I'll even go through 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 12, which he did not do, right? And show you again, this man is bankrupt. He is so compromised that no wonder Muslims love him. And so when Brandon House and others accused him of being a useful idiot for Islam, they were right, even though he hates to hear it, okay? How does God causing people who hate the truth and suppress the truth, causing them to believe a lie, how is that the same as saying that Allah is the best of all liars and deceivers? Help Again, help me, guys, please. I want to see what I'm missing. Can you guys help me? Help me see what I'm missing here. Okay, all right, let's continue. In the Bible, both Old and New Testament, uh, where God justly brings judgment uh, and deceives people. You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. God deceives In people. their rebellion. Let's God's under God no deceives. obligation to grant his truth to those who are justly condemned by their own actions. They're, they're sinners before God. God can bring about their destruction any way he chooses to do so. He can yeah, it's funny. People don't care if God uh, brings hailstones to destroy people. But if he uh, brings about their own destruction in some other fashion, oh, oh, oh that's, that, that's, that's, that's not fair. So anyways, in the book, I had uh, was actually looking at a section <clears throat> Let's see how fair uh, he was with the in, in the Quran. I attempted to be as fair as possible with the text when I was dealing with it. Uh, I can't, you know, so it was, well, but they're not fair with the Bible. Well, that's, that's not, that's not an option for, you see another lie here. You see another nasty, wicked ad hominem. Is that what Christians say? You really, can you name one Christian apologist, whether David Wood or Anthony Rogers, myself, that we justify quote unquote, <clears throat> attacking the Quran falsely. Because the Muslims do that to the Bible. Okay. Again, help me understand. Do you see any love out of this man? Do you see any humbleness from this man? Do you see any grace or Christ shining through this man? I mean, honestly. That's what we Christian apologists say. Well, they're not fair with the Bible, so we're not going to be fair with the Christ. Really? That's David Wood's argument? That's Anthony Rogers' argument? That's my argument? That's Osama Dakdok's argument. Can you point to one Christian apologist who justifies perverting the Quran because Muslims do that to the Bible? Because uh, mind you, understand what he's saying, right? That the Christians are knowingly, knowingly perverting this Quranic passage because they know better. They know what it means. They know it doesn't really mean Allah is the best deceiver of them all, making Satan look humble and truthful in comparison. They know it doesn't mean that. 
They know they're being dishonest, but they do it because Muslims treat the Bible in the same manner. Do you guys understand why this person is wicked, honestly? And why he needs to step down from being an elder and stop doing ministry? Now, honestly, I, I know I'm coming off harsh, but try to convince me otherwise that this man is not a useful idiot for Islam. His arrogance has gotten to him and he's become disgusting. Repulsive to deal with. Okay, let's finish it because I want to then refute, put holes in his exegesis or his false analogy. Okay. Christian. Uh, Christians have a much higher standard to, 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 to work with. Um, so I tried to be fair with it, and I, you know, I just basically said, you know, some people argue that this means that, you know, there's there's a, a fundamental problem with Allah's nature or something like that in the Quran. And I said, I don't think that's, that's uh, you know, a fair way of reading this text. It would... That's why you have no business doing apologetics among Muslims. You're a neophyte. You're not qualified. But in your arrogance, you think you're God's gift to the church and apologetics. May God convict you to repent. And until you do, I warn people, stay away from this man when it comes to Islam. Stay away from this man. Christian Prince was right. Nothing further, Your Honor. Seem that it, it would probably be better taken in this way. Well, he, uh, uh, Bassam took a picture of that and, and posted that. And it's interesting, um, even on the other side, you have certain folks, it's just, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You're, you're automatically going to be considered to be the bad guy. Um, this uh, John Fontaine guy uh, immediately comments, well, I, I, just, I just think this is, this, is, this is just a way to try to, you know, get people, to, it, basically attributing deception to me, uh, even in doing something, something like that, like being fair with the Quran. It's just, it's still a deceptive thing. So they have their people who it doesn't matter. You know, and of course we have our people. It doesn't matter what somebody else says. You know, you've got your own, you got your mind made up, you got your paradigm, and everybody just needs to fit into your paradigm. Now you tell me this is not a sign of hypocrisy, repulsively so. Notice, you got your paradigm, you made up your mind. And hold on. Isn't James White decrying everyone who doesn't fit in with his with his paradigm? Did you catch the attack right here? If you don't do apologetics the way James White does, and if you're not quote unquote consistent as James White does, then James White goes and bashes you and discredits you, right? So is this not the pot calling the kettle black? And again, convince me that his inconsistency and hypocrisy are not repulsive. Convince me. Okay. Did you catch the hypocrisy here? Well, if you don't fit their paradigm, then you know what? Then you know, whatever. But hold on, James. You just went on a rant, a rant, attacking Christian apologists for not doing things the way you do and even belittling them, right? Attacking them, assaulting their character by accusing them of not working through texts, biblical texts, the way you do. After all, if they did, then they would argue like you. Okay. Again, please correct me, rebuke me. Can you show me where I'm wrong to be disgusted by this man's personality, his arrogance, and his attack of, of Christian apologists work with Muslims? Okay, now let's finish so I can put holes to his arguments. I mean, there can't be any, you know, that's the easy way of doing things. Yeah, I gotta admit. You know, yeah, you just... gotta admit. If you don't do it James White's way, it's the easy way, it's the compromise way because James White is the standard to apologetics. Yes, and all oh, the humbleness just oozing out of his pores. So I'll put it, everything's black and white, and they, 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 they and we's we, and that's wicked, it. Wicked, um, wicked. But it, it doesn't really help get conversations uh, going and, and uh, yeah. actually get them to go anywhere uh, at all. Um, that's why I have seen hundreds thousands of Muslims running to Jesus Christ because of James White's approach. That's why Bassam Zawadi is now more closer to becoming a Christian than ever before because of James White's consistency. And Adnan Rashid, forget it. He's about to get baptized after the debate because of James White's consistency. Isn't he such a gift to the church? So uh, it was interesting just to, to see that. So anyway, uh, right. one of the... Um, subjects that we've addressed many times on the program that, that again has as okay anyway I, honestly i can't listen to this man anymore forgive me brethren but let's put holes 
through the argument. Here's my article. First of all, let's see what the Quran says and see if what the Quran says about Allah being a deceiver is analogous to the biblical statements that James White alluded to. Are you guys ready? And again, may the Lord forgive me for being angry with this man. It's because he has a platform and he can influence and dupe people, especially his fan base, into thinking that his arguments are solid and that he's consistent, that I need to expose this man. And I'm not the only one now. Thank the Lord. Even people from his own camp are exposing him and calling him, right? Calling him out for his arrogance. May God grant him repentance. May the Lord have mercy on him because he's going to answer a lot to Jesus Christ. Yet he thinks he's above reproach. Anyway. Here's the passage that he's alluding to. Let's see if you really knew the context of this passage. Let's see how much context. I want it to be fair to the context of the Quran. And I, okay, let's see. 354 of the Quran, chapter 3, verse 54. But they were deceitful, deceptive. The word is makaru. And Allah was deceitful, deceptive. For Allah is the best of all deceivers. The word is makar. Makar, chapter 3, verse 54. I'll revisit. The word makar in a minute, but let's see how the Arabic lexicons define the term makar. Okay, let's see how the Arabic lexicons define the term makar. It's in my paper, mim kaf ra. So you guys click on the link if you want to read it. The image is on my live stream, right? Mim kaf ra. Okay, let's read. <clears throat> to practice deceit or guile. Or circumvention. Let me repeat. To practice deceit or guile. So the one doing makar is practicing deceit or guile. Practice evasion or illusion. To plot. To exercise art or craft or cunning. Act with policy. Practice stratagem. Makar the verb. All right. He practiced deceit, guile, or circumvention. Desiring to do another a foul, an abominable, or an evil action. Clandestinely, or without his knowing, once it proceeded. Makaru, right? Makar. To deceive, delude, cheat, dupe, gull, double cross, right? To try to deceive. Makar, cunning, craftiness, spliness, willingness, double dealing, deception, trickery. Okay. Makar, ruse, artifice, stratagem, wile, trick, dodge, makar, and makur, cunning, sly, crafty, wily, shrewd, artful, sly. Crafty person, imposter, swindler, makar, and plural, makara, sly, cunning, wily. All right. So you see that the Arabic lexicons show that this word is negative in meaning, right? It refers to someone who's a deceiver, a trickster, a conniver. Now, again, according to the Quran, who's the best trickster, conniver, deceiver of them all? Not Satan, mind you. Allah, chapter 3, verse 54. But they were deceitful, deceptive, wa makaru, and Allah was deceitful, deceptive, wa makara Allahu. For Allah is the best of all deceivers. So here's a group of deceivers, connivers, tricksters, and Allah is the best among all of them. In other words, no one can out deceive like Allah. No one can trick and connive and scheme like Allah. Allah makes everyone else look like choir boys choir girls right he even makes satan look honest because when it comes to deceiving tricking conniving allah does them all okay but hold on we're not done yet let's see what else the quran says about allah okay let's see what the quran says about allah chapter 4 verse 142 the hypocrites chapter 4 verse 142 would deceive god but he will deceive them see they think they can deceive god but god out deceives them when they stand up for prayer, they stand carelessly to be seen of men, and they remember God, but little. All right. Okay, let's see what else. Okay, And I'm going to go into his biblical parallels to show you why this man really needs to step down as an elder. Okay, 1021. Okay. Chapter 10, verse 21. And when we make people taste of mercy after an affliction touches them, lo, they devise deception, makrun, against our communication. Say, Allah is quicker to deceive. Makran. Surely our apostles write down what you plan. Did you catch it? Once they devise to deceive, Allah outruns them. He is swift 
to deceive them even before they get a chance to deceive Allah and those who believe in him. Okay? He out deceives them. He outruns them in the sea. He beats them to the punch. Okay, 1342, and then I'm going to deal with the context. Because he says, I was looking at the context. No, you weren't. Exactly, Nakash, the serpent. No, you weren't. You're not looking at the context. Because the context 354 shows you that what the Quran says about Allah being a deceiver, right, is far from what the Bible says about Yahweh permitting people to be deceived. And shame on you for making the two somehow morally equivalent or similar. 1342. And verily, those before them did plot deception, makara. But all deception is Allah's. Wow, did you catch it? All deception belongs to Allah. You guys see it? 1342. He knows what every person earns, and the disbelievers will know who gets the good end. All right. Wait, we got more. This one is a doozy. 799. Chapter 7, verse 99 of the Quran. Chapter 7, verse 99. Now let me know if it's putting you to sleep, guys. Chapter 7, verse 99. Are they then secure from Allah's deception? Makra Allah. Are they then secure from Allah's deception? Makra Allah. None deemeth himself secure from Allah's deception, save folk that perish. Makra Allah. Now let me explain what this means. It's saying, do the unbelievers think, right, that they're going to be safe, safe from Allah's deception, his conniving, his scheming against them? The only ones, the only ones, right, that think they can be safe from Allah's deception are those who perish because they're oblivious to Allah's true nature. Let me explain what this means. Ironically, this passage is saying that believers know enough and know better than to trust Allah's makkah, his scheming. Believers know that if Allah schemes, if Allah decides to use makkah against you, you have no hope. So they know better than to feel secure, secure from Allah's makkah, his scheming, his conniving, his trickery. It's only the folk who perish, who don't know Allah enough, that think they are safe from his makkah, from his scheming, from his conniving, from his tricks. Did that sink in? Did you understand what I what this verse is saying? Before I move on, did you get it or no? All right. All right. Did you get it or no? Do you understand what this passage just said? Believers who know their God, who know Allah, know better than to feel safe from Allah's schemes, his deceit, his guile. They know better because they know their God. Now, you're telling me, you're telling me that these statements are analogous to what the Bible says about Yahweh handing people over to judgment by allowing evil spirits to deceive them, that what the Quran says is analogous, similar to what the Bible says about Yahweh and how he treats unbelievers? Thank you, first and last, you captured it perfectly. So in other words, believers are scared of Allah's deception. You better believe it. They know better. And grace go even more beautiful. If you know Allah, then you know you can't trust him. Thank you. Now, again, help me understand. Maybe I'm wrong. Are you telling me that these statements of the Quran are similar to, analogous to what the Bible says about Yahweh and how he treats unbelievers? Okay. Now, let me tell you what this sounds like. Let me show you and tell you what this sounds like. Okay. There you go. And I'm going to address the false analogies with the Hebrew scriptures and 2 Thessalonians. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Lying is second nature to the devil. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Right? Actually, Revelation 12. 9 to 12. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. Revelation 12, 9 to 12. The great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. We'll just stop at verse 9. When the Quran says that Allah is the best of all deceivers, and all deception is Allah's, and no one feels secure from Allah's deception except folk that perish, because believers know enough and no better than to trust their own God and his schemes and lies and trickery. 
Does that sound like what the Bible says about Yahweh? Or does that sound like what the Bible says about Satan, the devil? What does that sound like? Can someone help me understand? Does that sound like what the Bible says about Yahweh? Or what the Bible says about Satan, how Satan is described? And it, James White, because he's consistent now, you have to follow his paradigm. Or he's going to accuse you of being inconsistent and not dealing with texts of Scripture, right? Or is James White right that the Quranic language of Allah is similar to the way the Bible describes Yahweh's dealing with unbelievers? You tell me. What does it sound like? So everyone with me there? Is that clear? Everyone got it? All right. Now, let me make it even worse for James White. He claimed to have read, he claimed to have read the context of that statement. I'm about to expose that assertion. Let me give him benefit of doubt. He may have thought he was reading the context, but in reality, he didn't understand the context of this passage. Here's 354, okay? 354. Now, do me a favor, first and last. Are you able to post 355 for me? Let me give you the context of this passage. But they were deceitful. The Jews were deceitful, deceptive. And Allah was deceitful, deceptive. For Allah is the best of all deceivers. Let me tell you what the context is. The context is the Jews plotting to kill Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 55. That's the context. The Jews' scheme plotted to kill Jesus. Allah out-schemed them, out-plotted them. How do we know? Read the verses before and after. Specifically, let's read verse 55. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who re reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me, and I will judge between you of the matters wherein ye dispute. Okay, you see what the context is? The Jews' scheme plotted against Jesus to kill him. Allah schemed and outplotted them. Now let's see how Allah out plotted the Jews 4157 4157 to see if it's anything like what the Bible says concerning Yahweh's treatment of unbelievers 4157 okay let's see no wonder Basam Zawadi likes James White he doesn't like me thank you so 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 put it perfectly Allah's deceiving James White that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear unto them. Now, if we take the typical view, the typical view, which happens to be the oldest view documented concerning the interpretation of this passage. According to the typical view, Allah made it appear unto the Jews that they actually killed Jesus by having someone look like Jesus and having that look-alike killed in the place of Jesus, right? Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? So now, let me ask you a question. Who made it appear unto the Jews that they killed Jesus? By having someone look like Jesus from head to toe. Who transformed the physical appearance of that substitute to look exactly like Jesus from head to toe in order to have him killed in the place of Jesus so that he could save Jesus. Allah, right? Muhammad's God? Now, here's my question. Because of that act of deception on the part of Allah, did that not foist biblical Christianity upon the world? Right? After all, who went around proclaiming Christ was killed on the cross and was raised on the third day? If not the very disciples of Jesus Christ. Therefore, that means Allah not only deceived the unbelievers, but deceived the followers of Christ into thinking it was Jesus who died and came to life. Therefore, thereby foisting biblical Christianity on the world. So did Allah discriminate in whom he deceived? Or he deceived both believer and unbeliever alike, foisting on the world one of the greatest scams known to man, biblical Christianity. And this is analogous to what the Bible says about Yahweh 
causing unbelievers to be deceived because of their rebellion and hatred of the truth. But it's going to get worse. Chapter 3, verse 54 is also found in chapter 8, verse 30. Chapter 3, verse 54 is also found in chapter 8, verse 30. And this one is more damaging. Can you post that for me? Brother, let me put on the other screen. Hold on. Let me do this. Chapter 8, verse 30. Let me just get the screen. All right. Remember how the unbelievers plotted against thee. The word is deceive. It's it's makr. To keep thee in bonds or slay thee or get thee out of thy home. They plot and plan. They deceive. It's makr. Allah two plans, deceives. But the best of planners is Allah. The best of all deceivers is Allah, right? You catch it? Everyone there? Okay, now, this is talking about the battle of Badr. Let me explain to you. When the Muslims went to attack a Meccan caravan in order to rob it, the Meccans were prepared. <clears throat> and had a thousand men ready to attack the Muslim raiders. Because again, they had been doing it for a period of time and the Meccans got fed up with it. They'd send caravans and the Muslims would then raid them, right? Marauders would come and then attack them and steal their, their possessions. So they were ready. A thousand pagans were ready at Badr to defend against the Muslim raiders attacking them. This is the battle of Badr. This is what chapter 8 verse 30 is talking about. That's the context. Let's see what Allah had to do to convince Muslims <clears throat> to fight the larger contingent of unbelievers. Because according to the tradition, there are a thousand pagans from Mecca ready to do battle, to defend against the attack of the Muslims. And there are only about 313 Muslims. Let's see what Allah had to do to encourage and embolden the Muslims to fight the unbelievers. Chapter 8, verses 43 to 44. Chapter 8, verses 43 to 44. Remember in thy dream, this is talking to Muhammad, pay attention. Remember in thy dream, Allah showed them to thee as a few. Speaking to Muhammad, remember Muhammad, in your dream, we showed the pagans to be few. Why? Why did Allah do that? Pay attention, guys. If he had shown them to thee as many, if he actually showed you how many they were, ye would have surely have been discouraged and you would have surely have disputed in your decision. But Allah saved you, for he knoweth well the secrets of all hearts. Did you guys catch it? In order to convince the 313 Muslims to fight the larger contingent, Allah deceived Muhammad in a dream into thinking they were smaller than they were act they actually were. And Allah says why he did it. Had we showed you as many, you'd have been discouraged and would have been disputing among yourselves whether to fight. So Allah saved you from that by showing them to be fewer in number in order to encourage you to attack. I don't know if you caught it. Let's read the next verse, verse 44. And remember when you met, he showed them to you as few in your eyes, right? And he made you appear as contemptible in their eyes, that Allah might accomplish a matter already enacted, for to Allah do all things go back for decision. Did you catch it? Allah deceived believers, Muhammad and his followers, by making it appear unto them that the pagans were fewer in number in order to save them from being afraid, in order to embolden them to attack the unbelievers. Okay, now, can you show me anywhere in the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament where the true God deceives believers in this manner? So who gave him a lying dream? Who inspired Muhammad with a dream that showed the unbelievers to be fewer in number in order to embolden the men to fight? Allah. You're telling me this is similar to the statements in the Bible? You're telling me that what we just read is similar to those passages in the Bible where Yahweh, as part of just judgment upon stiff-necked, rebellious sinners who hate his truth, handing them over to false prophets, false teachers, because that's what they deserve for refusing to accept the truth that he's made plain to them. The two are similar. The two are analogous. Is that what you want me to believe? Is that what you want me to believe? Okay. Now let's go into the passages that he was alluding to. 
Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. Remember, if only these apologists had worked through these texts. Thank you, Ryan. Right? Sounds like Satan, doesn't it? Not the true God of the Bible. If only these apologists were to work through these texts, then they'd be like me, God's gift to apologetics. All right. All right. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 12. Right? Even him. Now, it's talking about the man of lawlessness. Right? When we call the Antichrist arising in the latter days before Christ returns. Even him, the man of lawlessness, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, pay attention. Who's empowering the man of lawlessness to perform miracles, wonders, to deceive and lie and mislead people? Who's actually giving him the power to do it? Who's working through him to do these signs and wonders to deceive people from the truth? Who's doing it here, guys? God or Satan? God, right? Okay. Let's read because I want you to put that in mind because this is one of the texts he alluded to. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. So who's perishing? Who's falling for the lies? The lying wonders, miracles that convince them that the man of lawlessness is truly God and worthy of their worship and allegiance? Who's perishing? Who's falling for these lies? Those who through their unrighteousness suppress the truth who love wickedness and deceit more than they love the truth. Really? You don't see it? Okay. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Bam. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There you go. Now, what does it mean? God caused them to, you know, to believe a lie sent them a strong delusion in the context what is the strong delusion that god sent what was the strong delusion that god sent upon them in the context what is this referring to now grace girl said agent what agent is god sending who's actually the one doing the deceiving doing the deception the trickery the scheming satan man all you guys got it. God is sending them Satan. Because Satan has to get God's permission to do this. To empower the man of lawlessness. To do wonders and miracles. To dupe people into following the man of lawlessness to their destruction. Why? Because you just read. They hate the truth. They suppress the truth. They love their wickedness and unrighteousness. So God is giving them what they desire. And justly so. Once again, help me understand, because I don't have a doctorate like James White does, and I'm not in a PhD program like James White. Help me understand. Is this at all analogous to what we just read in the Quran? Is this at all similar to what we read in the Quran? You got it, Mickey. He's Allah's not even the dirt under the shoes of Jesus our Lord. Okay. Well, wait, hold on. You chose an easy one. No, I didn't. James White chose this. James White chose this. What do you do with Ezekiel 14, 9 to 10? Okay, what do we do with it? Hatun, are you following with me, by the way, sister? Okay. So, so fly me out. I'll be there by the grace of God. All right, Ezekiel 14, 9 to 10. Oh, I got you, Sam. And by the way, I wrote an article on this. Does Yahweh deceive in response to Basam Zawadi years ago? And here James White is fawning over the fact that Basam Zawadi praised James White. You see, we've been consistent. Even Basam Zawadi, who's so close to accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ because of my ministry, Alpha and Omega, he praises me for my consistency. Talk about throwing up, right? Barf City. Ezekiel 14, 9 to 10. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Oh, we got you, Sam. This is one of the passages that Basam used against me, which I wrote a Thor response to. See, Yahweh's deceiving that prophet. See, Yahweh does deceive. Gotcha. Okay, hold on. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Okay, now. I have said this in the past and I'll repeat again. 
Oftentimes, the Bible will ascribe to God the actions performed by others. So oftentimes, you'll read in the passage that God did X, when in reality, it wasn't God. It was an agent who did it with God's permission and for a purpose, right? And this is found all throughout scriptures, all throughout scriptures. In fact, if you don't know this, then that means you haven't worked through the text of the Bible, because if you did, you would see that this is something that you find over and over and over again in the scriptures. Let me give you just two examples, okay? Real quick. Let's go to Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Because I'm going to show you what it means that Yahweh deceived the false prophet who deceived the people. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord. Israel's is my son, even my firstborn. Now watch this. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So God is saying he's going to personally kill the firstborn of Egypt. Hold on. Let's go to Exodus 12, 20, 23. Who actually did the slaying? Exodus 12, 23. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 23. Okay. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Wait, wait, wait. I thought the Lord will smite the Egyptians. But here it says it's not God doing the smiting. The destroyer is. And the destroyer is under God's control. He can constrain him. Or let him loose. Did you catch it? So who's actually killing the firstborn? Who's actually slaying the firstborn of Egypt? Not God, but the destroyer. So why is God being held accountable? Because ultimately, no one can do anything without God permitting it. So he's not the one doing the act, but permitting the act to be done and justly upon a people who deserve it. Right? Do you see it there? Psalm 78, 49 makes the same point. Psalm 78, 49. Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, talking about the Exodus, wrath and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. So who is doing the killing, the striking? These evil angels. The destroying angel, destroying angels, and yet God takes responsibility for the actions of others because that's how Scripture functions. The Bible will often ascribe to God the actions of others, and you see this clearly in the example of Job. If you read Job's chapter 1 and 2, Job chapter 1 and 2, you'll notice it's Satan who rose against Job, right? Satan did it. He's the one who caused marauders to rob him. He's the one who brought a physical infliction. He's the one who got his children killed. He's the one behind all of that. And I'm sure in union with evil spirits. Let's go to Job 2, verses 1 to 3. Job 2, verses 1 to 3. So I can explain what Ezekiel 14 does not mean. All right? Job 2, 1 to 3. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from, from walking up and down in it. Now, mind you, side note, here's proof that Satan is not omnipresent. Although he travels much faster than we do, he still has to travel from place to place. He can't be in more than one place at the same time. Did you catch it? In the context, we know why he's traveling. He's traveling because he's looking for someone to devour. Okay, let's continue. Verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, right? Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Wait, wait, wait. God is saying, Satan, you moved me against him to destroy him. Really? Really? Wait, according to Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, 
God didn't move against Job to destroy him. Satan did. Satan did, right? So can you explain to me why God is taking responsibility for the actions of Satan? Can you explain to me why God is taking responsibility for the actions of Satan? Because Satan could not touch Job, move against Job, without God permitting it. Everyone with me there? So this is how the language of Scripture functions. This is how Scripture speaks. It will attribute to God the actions of creatures, especially his agents, because these agents, these creatures, could not do what they're doing without God, without God permitting it. Is that clear? So what does it mean that when a false prophet deceives the people, God is deceiving that false prophet to deceive them. What does that mean? What does it mean? Is God actually speaking lies and deception through the prophet? Is his mouth uttering deceit, trickery, lies? Or is this simply the biblical way of saying God is permitting an unclean evil spirit to inspire a false prophet to give his people who hate the true prophets and hate God and his truth what they want to tickle their ears? You don't need to guess. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23 tells you. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23 tells you. Let's see. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23 tells you. Thank you, Naimeth. Praise the Lord for you. Okay, now let's read. The context is the king of Israel wants to go up in battle in Ramoth Gilead. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, asks him to inquire of God. So then, the king of Israel has prophets prophesying, and they all tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Go up, for he'll give you victory in battle. Now, Jehoshaphat wasn't comfortable with their prophesying. So he goes, Isn't there a man of God here? In some way, he sensed these prophets were not really truly prophets of God. And so in the context, the king of Israel says, yeah, there is a man of God here, but I don't like him because he doesn't preach anything good. He's always preaching calamity against me, Micaiah, okay? This is the context. So Micaiah says, go up, for surely the Lord has given you victory, mockingly saying it. And the king of Israel realized he was mocking. And he told them, didn't I tell you to always tell me the truth? So tell me what you heard. This is the context, 1 Kings 22. 19 to 23. Now notice how Yahweh deceives false prophets. Pay attention. And even James White alluded to it, and yet still he thinks that somehow similar to what the Quran says, which again proves you have no business talking about Islam. Step down for the love of God. Leave us alone. Leave it to us. Step down. Now, 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade? By the way, if you guys don't know, that word persuade is the same Hebrew word deceive in Ezekiel 14. Did you guys know that? It's the same word. Same Hebrew word. Here it's rendered as persuade because the word in Hebrew can mean persuade, entice, seduce, right? Prevail, deceive, same word as in Ezekiel 14, 9 to 10. Who shall persuade Ahab, the king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. Also, I will deceive him. Same Hebrew word. Okay. Now let's read. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? How? How are you going to do it? Read with me, guys. And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. There you go. God never utters anything that's unholy. Not a single lie or deceit ever comes out of the mouth of God. But who, who, who is doing the lying? The deceiving, the conniving, the trickery? Unclean evil spirits with God's permission. I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade 
also can be rendered deceive. And prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now before I move on, how did God put a lying spirit in their in their mouth? Did he thrust the lying spirit into them? Or he allowed the lying spirit to go forth and inspire each and one of them with the same deceptive lying message? How did he do it? And yet notice it says God put the spirit in them. No, he didn't. He told the spirit, go ahead, go forth, go and do it. So literally, he didn't put anything in them. He allowed the, the spirit to come to them and inspire them to lie. Did everyone see that before I move on? Right? Now, someone said it looks like God was looking for someone to lie in the first place. Thank you for proving my point, CMK. The fact that he's looking for someone to lie means God cannot lie. He cannot lie. And therefore, in his sovereignty, will use and allow lying spirits to lie through false prophets to give people who hate him and his truth what they want. After all, you don't want the truth? You want lies? You want people to tickle your ears? You want deceit? I will give it to you until it comes out of your nostrils. Catch it? Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Something happened. I'm in the wrong room. Everyone got it? Is that clear? So, once again, before I continue, is this at all similar to Allah deceiving both believers and unbelievers that they think Jesus died on the cross? Is this at all similar to Allah lying to Muhammad in a dream? Giving Muhammad the impression that the pagans at Badr were fewer in number because if he showed them as many, then the Muslims would be afraid and wouldn't go in battle. Is this at all similar to Allah being the one who lies and deceives personally and gives his own prophet a lying dream to deceive him? Not of unclean spirit, mind you. This is coming directly from Allah as the source. Is this similar? To what we just read in the Holy Bible? It, uh, honestly, be, don't tell me what I want to hear. Don't tickle my ears. Show me where I'm wrong. Is it at all similar? Now, uh, CMK, please don't pontificate before I bounce you from my room. God does sit on a throne because that same God who is formless and shapeless can assume visible form and heaven is a dimension of space and place. And therefore, in heaven, God manifests himself on a throne that the inhabitants of heaven see. Do me a favor, CMK. Stop pontificating, please. Listen and learn by the grace of God. Okay? Sorry about that. Because I was being distracted by someone. Now, now, what's even more important and relevant in refuting James White, showing he's a neophyte who should not be dealing with these issues? Did you catch what 1 Kings 22 said? Did you catch it? Did you pay attention carefully? Did you read it? Notice that 1 Kings 22, Micaiah actually tells Ahab what's taking place. He actually told Ahab, these prophets are lying to you because they have a lying spirit inspiring them to deceive you to go into battle. In other words, God even made known to Ahab his real agenda. And what was the agenda? God is going to cause Ahab to go into battle in order to kill him dead. In other words, God even told him the truth. And still in his stubbornness, instead of refusing to go to the battle, if you read the rest of the chapter 28, Ahab goes to the battle in disguise thinking he can outwit God. And yet one of the people shot an arrow that hit Ahab. And because of that wound, he ended up dying exactly like God said. So in this very passage, God ends up making the truth known to Ahab, showing you that God doesn't need a lying spirit to get him to go to battle. God can do it by proclaiming the truth with no power being able to refute what God has planned shall take place. You guys see it? Is that clear? Once again, I'm a little stupid, 
I don't have a PhD, not in a PhD program, and I don't have a doctor like James White. So forgive me. Once again, can you show me how this is analogous to the description of Allah in the Quran? Yes, I like that. Let me repeat it so that James White can hear. Mickey Afrata. With James White, we're losing a very great apologist. Sadly, he has been deceived. Yep, you hit it on the nail. May God have mercy on him, as I want God have mercy on all of us. May the blood of Jesus wash him in all of us and save us. Because this man at one time was great, but his arrogance is his downfall. May the Lord grant him repentance. And one sign is he needs to step down, really. I'm not the only one who says it. You have even people of his own camp saying he needs to step down, right? Now, before I move on, is it clear that nothing that James White said regarding these biblical passages justify the Quran's description of the Muslim God being the best of all deceivers, better than Satan himself? Is it clear? Oh, not so fast. Not so fast. Jeremiah says Yahweh is a deceiver, and he's a true prophet. Jeremiah says Yahweh is a deceiver, and he's a true prophet. Let's go to Jeremiah 4.10. Let's see. Okay, CMK, God bless you. Thank you for sharing your opinion. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people. And Jerusalem saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. Real quick. Number one, nowhere did God tell Israel they'll have peace. Nowhere did God say in the book of Jeremiah that the people in Jerusalem will have peace. In fact, the opposite is true. He went out of his way to warn them, if you don't repent, I'm going to bring the Babylonians to punish you and take you into captivity. That's number one. Number two, just because the Bible is inspired doesn't mean every conversation that it records is inspired. In other words, the Bible is an inspired record that contains the speeches, the opinions of uninspired, fallible men, even Satan himself. This is what Jeremiah thought. But Jeremiah was wrong. In fact, Jeremiah came very close to blaspheming the Lord. Not only here, but elsewhere. Let me show you where the Lord has to rebuke Jeremiah for speaking foolishly. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 to 21. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 to 21. Right? So, the Bible's inspired record that contains the uninspired speeches, opinions of imperfect fallible human beings and Satan himself without necessarily approving of those speeches or statements or claims to show you that Jeremiah not always spoke righteously correctly but at times in his anger and sinfulness spoke foolishly and stupidly here you go Jeremiah 15 verses 15 to 21 O Lord Yahweh Jehovah thou knowest remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. People rebuke me because I love you. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand. For thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual? And my own incurable, which refuseth to be healed. Wilt thou wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as the waters that fail? Did you catch the blasphemy here? Jeremiah was so miserable and depressed because people were attacking him, ostracizing him because of the word of God. He got angry with God. God, look, I'm miserable. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm all alone. Right? Did you lie to me? You told me you're living waters. Yet when I came to be refreshed, you failed me. You see, he's throwing God's words back at God. God had told his people that he's the living waters. So he goes, when I came to you, a brook, expecting to be refreshed, you failed me. So did you lie to me? Now watch what God does. Jeremiah 15, 19 to 21. Okay. So you're in good company, folks. If you're feeling sad and miserable and, and God... Disappointing you, even though you're wrong, no, you're in good company. Even prophets felt that way. But now notice what the Lord says in Jeremiah 15, 19 to 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again, 
Notice Jeremiah got to the point he had to repent. If you return and repent, I'll bring you again. I'll use you again. Because right now you've disqualified yourself from ministry. And thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vile. In other words, stop speaking vile, stupid things. Only speak that which is precious and valuable. Thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee. But return not thou unto them. And I'll make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. And they shall fight against thee. But they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Did you see? Jeremiah got to the point where God had to chasten him said, and tell him, say to him, repent and I will use you again. Stop speaking vile, stupid words. Say only that which is precious and true, and you'll be my mouth again. What's the point? Just because Jeremiah says that God deceived the people, or thought that God disappointed him, deceived him, doesn't mean he's right. That's when he was speaking foolishly and in sin. Everyone got it? Notice God is not intimidated and doesn't throw a tantrum when you accuse him falsely. Being a perfect God, a good God, a loving God, he deals with you gently and waits patiently. Okay, Jeremiah, enough stupidity, enough foolishness out of your mouth. Come back to me and I'll use you again. Right? Is there one, do you guys see this now? Right? All right. Now, again, let me repeat what the Bible says God does. And even James White noted it. Yet sadly, he still couldn't see that refutes his pathetic attempt of justifying what the Quran says about Allah being the best of all deceivers and livers and schemers, right? God justly in righteousness and justice can send lying spirits to inspire false prophets and teachers to speak lies and deception to people who have shown a propensity to turn their back on God's truth because they'd rather continue in sin and evil and unrighteousness than repent and embrace God's truth. So God gives those people what they deserve and what they themselves want. They don't want sound preaching. They don't want sound doctrine. They don't want to be called to holiness. They want to justify their immorality. And every time a true prophet or teacher comes, they shun that teacher, mock him and or kill him. So God says, okay, you've shown that you don't want the truth. Let me give you men and women after the desires of your heart. But with that said, note, at no instance is God ever lying to anyone. Is God ever speaking falsehood? Is God ever speaking deceit and trickery? Not a single lie or deceit comes out of the holy mouth of God. The lying and the deception come from lying spirits that God permits to inspire liars, false teachers, false prophets to give people who hate him and the truth what they want. How is that analogous to what the Quran says about Allah and how he treats not just unbelievers, but believers? Can you, can you, can you help me understand? Lord, loosen my tongues to speak truth without error for the glory of Christ. Can you help me understand? Now you're telling me James White doesn't see this? All the more reason why stay away from him when it comes to Islam. Do not endorse his materials or his book. And this man needs to step down. May God grant him repentance to be humble enough to do so. Save him and all of us and have mercy on me in the blood of Jesus. Never to get to the point that he's reached and save me from my own wretchedness, right? I hope this session was clear and I hope you saw the foolishness of likening what the Bible says about Yahweh and how he causes the wicked, the unrighteous, the immoral to be deceived with the Quran's plain statements that the best deceiver of them all, one who makes even Satan look honest and honest by comparison is Allah himself. Shame on him. May the Lord convict him to repent. May the Lord save people from his damaging, his, his, his instructions which are more damaging than good. May the Lord save him from his arrogance and save us from our own flesh in Jesus' name. With that said, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, cover us by your holy blood and our loved ones. In my case, my daughters, shield them and their mother by your blood. Your holy blood, Lord Jesus, save them because it's your blood that gives us victory.
over the evil one. And use my meager efforts. And Lord, forgive me if I have sinned in my anger. And I pray I made no mistakes. Bless all who will hear this. And convict James White to repent. And save us also from our own wretchedness and flesh. So we don't reach that point. We remain humble and teachable and in love with you. Increase in us, O Lord Jesus. And have mercy on all of us, even on James White. In Jesus' name, amen.